wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. Um, a lot of chords there struck with um, Roger's talk, but some differences as well. I think there'll be lots to discuss. But before that, I'd now like to hand over to Professor Mike Hume, um, who again is unbelievably well qualified to talk about these issues. He's a professor of climate change at the University of East Anglia where he founded the Tyndall Center for Climate Change Research, which is a virtual network center, as well as having a UEA base in 2000, and he directed it until 2007. Um, since that time, he's been working not only as a top climate scientist, but also as someone who's been offering some really key contributions around the place of science in climate change politics and the relationships between science and politics in one of the most heated fields in which these controversies have arisen. So, Mike, over to you. Thank you. So uh, one of the common public expectations of science is that it speaks authoritatively about the way the physical world works uh, and therefore what the physical consequences of different human actions and interventions are likely to be. Science and scientists therefore are believed to offer something different to public life compared to politicians, journalists, lawyers, priests, celebrities. But what is meant by authoritative? And how does, public, how does scientific practice best earn and maintain authority in the face of public challenge and scepticism? In these few remarks, I want to explore one important dimension of scientific authority building, namely the interplay between the ideas of consensus and dissensus. And I want to do this exploration using the example of the IPCC uh, which I know just a little about. The question I wish to answer then can be put simply, does the pronouncement of a scientific consensus on an issue such as climate change increase or weaken the authority of science? And for whom exactly does this claim work? Scientists, different publics, policy makers, politicians? Now, the IPCC has made a very specific claim as to its consensus-making character. As too have many commentators outside the IPCC, whether, again, they be politicians, lobbyists, advocates, uh, advocates or critics. Thus, uh, in the very first IPCC report, Sir John Horton, chairing Working Group 1, in his foreword in 1990, said, the peer review has helped ensure a high degree of consensus among authors and reviewers regarding the results presented. And here is one rhetorical, visual display from an IPCC media release in 2007 with a fourth assessment report. Uh, two and a half thousand uh, expert reviewers, 800 contributing authors, 450 lead authors, 130 countries, six years work, four volumes, one report will come out. Uh, or then we have uh, this example from uh, Kevin Rudd, uh, Australian Prime Minister in November 2009, uh, <coughs> when uh, ahead of the Copenhagen uh, conference, he drawing attention to the overwhelming global scientific consensus, its long-standing uh, nature. Or from a media outlet, uh, this example from February 2007, uh, the Guardian newspaper, the UN's vast report will end the scientific argument. Now will the world act. But is the IPCC right to be aiming for and proclaiming a scientific consensus, at least in the way that it does? Or to ask the question more generally, when seeking to be authoritative on complex issues of public policy importance, should science be issuing consensus statements? Maybe you think the answer to this is an obvious one, but let me put a different view. Uh, the Norwegian social theorist, uh, uh, John Elster, a few years ago, remarked, I would, be in fact, uh, I would in fact tend to have more confidence in the outcome of a democratic decision if there was a minority that voted against it than if it was unanimous. Well, if this is true of a democracy, then could this also be true of science? Would people have more confidence in climate science if there was a minority view for example, about uh, evidence of climate attribution or about future climate risks. That was officially recognised by bodies such as the IPCC. 
rather than climate science being presented as an all-encompassing consensus. Just compare uh, what's implied in that headline from The Guardian there, that action follows unanimity. In the article in which Elster is quoted, the philosophers of science John Beatty and Alfred Moore develop exactly this argument, and I believe it applies very well to the case of climate change in the IPCC. Now, the argument in favour of consensus as authoritative is that it reflects what science supposedly is uniquely disposed to be good at. Applying rules of reasoning which lead unambiguously and universally from evidence to conclusion. The same evidence presented to the same disciplined mind leads to precisely the same conclusion. A lack of consensus, then, in this mind, would undermine the authority of science, because it might suggest uh, that conflicting conclusions had been reached prematurely, or that personal or cultural biases and values had protruded into this rational process. Now, this is the position that seems to be implicitly assumed by many protagonists in the climate change debate whether mainstream or critical voices. It was the view expressed by Sir John Horton above, uh, and it's the view of climate critics, who assert that science properly conducted should lead to unanimous consent. Therefore, by pointing out the existence of minority dissenting positions outside the IPCC, ipso facto, the authority of science is undermined, in the eyes at least of the public. It's interesting to note how Sir John Horton, in fact, prefaced that remark in his foreword. Because beforehand, immediately, he said, there is a minority of opinions which we have not been able to accommodate. Now, the argument against consensus as authoritative, at least in the context of wicked problems like climate change, seems to me to be compelling. And let me just mention three aspects of this argument, uh, although Beatty and Moore uh, actually expand others too. First of all, majority rule works very effectively in maintaining expert authority in other social institutions. For example, parliaments or the courts, voting MPs and voting juries. Maybe the IPCC's authority in the eyes of critics and the public, if not in the eyes of politicians, would have been enhanced had it acted upon its own option for minority reporting, uh, which to my knowledge it never has done. There is a fallacy pushed, particularly by some of the campaigning NGOs from the very early 1990s onwards, that the stronger the climate consensus, the easier it is for lobbyists to use science to advance their own goals and objectives. The second uh, <coughs> argument uh, that the requirement of con consensus is in fact pernicious. It encourages agreement in a group of experts where there is none in order to protect the authority of the group. Maybe the IPCC should more openly embrace the idea, for example, of expert elicitation or even expert voting, as has been suggested, for example, by David Guston when he remarked a few years ago, a scientific body that does not partake in the politics of transparent social choice is not a fully democratic one. For example, such an approach to disagreement, uh, <coughs> elicitation or explicit voting, uh, could usefully have been applied in the case of the sea level rise controversy in the fourth assessment report uh, of, AR, uh, of, of the IPCC. It makes disagreements explicit and better reflects the quasi-rationality of scientific deliberation. Uh, the third argument is, is that the presence of officially sanctioned, even officially welcomed minorities, and therefore embracing dissensus, actually enhances the authority of science. It shows that it's okay to disagree, and thus indicates that the deliberative procedures of a body like the IPCC are fair and accommodating to the full range of views. For science or climate science to be authoritative, it should therefore welcome, indeed seek out, criticism. And in the case of large international assessments like the IPCC and, for example, IPBES, now forming uh, shape, uh, it should allow uh, <coughs> uh, minority reporting. Uh, this is in contradiction 
to Sir John Horton's conclusion, because after the comment I made, the following, following sentence then went on to say, thus, the assessment is an authoritative statement. The logic that Sir John Horton went through is, here are minority views, we can't accommodate them, we've created a consensus, therefore we are authoritative. This, I would say, is the true tragedy of climate gate. Not that the crew emails reveal any fundamental faking of substantive data or fraudulent practice. No. But that they showed a scientific culture which was closed to criticism and which was resistant to the open sharing of data. When, this, when the tenacity of defending the in-group, out-group distinctions was exposed. Paradoxically, this weakened the public authority of climate science rather than strengthened it. The outcome was the exact opposite of what my colleagues and crew thought that they were doing. By going down this path, climate scientists have handed the scientifically credentialed critics of climate science an easy target. And in turn, this has handed the politically credentialed critics of climate policies a powerful handle for converting the ag ag agnostic, sorry, the agonistic spaces of legitimate and healthy democratic argument into distracting, yet very publicly entertaining, arguments about the authority of science. Thus has the IPCC consensus become a source of scientific weakness in the turbulence of social discourse and climate change, rather than one of strength. And these two examples, just out of many, show how consensus then becomes the lightning rod, the uh, 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 mobilising uh, narrative uh, for uh, uh, attacks and criticisms uh, on the IPCC. Thank you.